those of you online right now, if you can see me, just uh, somebody raise their hand or. Can anybody see me? Jim, this is Nita. We see you good. What's that? We can see you good. You say you can? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, that was your phone. Okay. I've been dusting stuff down. Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints of the marrow of the critic and the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thirty furnished into all good works. Study to show your self approval to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We'll take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. You know what that is. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord. If you have any unfessed sin in your life, go ahead and do so. Function and operation cry, and you'll be ready to go. I'll close out of prayer time. Father, it's an amazing day. I thank you for every person that's in the room here, online, on Facebook, and anyone that might, anyone that might come to us at a later time. Father, we're living in troubling times. As a pastor teacher, it is my responsibility to stand strong, teach the word of God, the unadulterated truth, the inspired and errant and infallible word of God to those who are willing to listen. Father, as we study this passage of scripture in Numbers chapter 13 through 17, I'm going to pray, Father, that the minds of the folks that are listening today will be open to receive the truth. And that in mind, Father, I'm going to commit this service to you, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. And uh, I pray that uh, we'll be open to hear the word of God in Christ's name. Amen. This is not, this is not today a political rally, but I do want you to understand that we have two men in the room right now that are running for county sheriff. Dennis Ball is running for county sheriff in Perry County, and Calvin Grogan right here is running for uh, for county sheriff in Pulaski County. Now, if you are going to be voting this time, and I hope you do, I want you to keep both of these men in mind. You can't move to you can't move to uh, to Perry County now and vote for. Uh, our friend Dennis, unless you want to, but uh, it's one vote per person, okay? So make sure you consider that. Now, with that in, with that behind us, I want to say to you that I'm doing this a little bit differently today. Normally, I sit down, but I want to stand up today because I'm not going to use the notes on the screen. What I have to say to you is absolutely imperative that you understand if you want to be able to face the future with any type of security, any type of peace, any type of uh, happiness in spite of all the circumstances that are going on. We are in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. You entered that conflict the moment you were born physically. The day you were born again, you went to the front lines. And there is a high ground, there's a high ground that we're to achieve in the Christian way of life. Salvation is not the end of the Christian way of life. Salvation is only the beginning. Therefore, between now and the time the rapture occurs or until the time you die, it is your responsibility. You are mandated to become a born again Christian and a, and a mature Christian. Listen, it's not my mandate. This is God. 
all I am is a mouthpiece. So I have nothing, I have no interest in this thing in the sense that I'm not trying to promote me. Like the Apostle Paul, I know who I am. I know where I came from. But I've been inspired by the word of God to share the truth with you. Now, when we go to our notes, what I want you to do is I don't want you to get confused by reading your notes and miss something I'm saying. What I'm saying is going to be important. You can follow that in your notes if you want to. But when you get to focusing on the notes, you're going to miss what I say. And all you have to do is miss one little spot there where you don't fill in the blank. And it's just about to be worthless to you, okay? So I'm going to start here. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read my notes and share with you what God has laid on my heart to teach from the book of Numbers. I haven't been in the Old Testament I don't know how long. Here's what I want to do. I want you to compare something. I want you to compare the spiritual status of the Jewish believers that were wandering in the wilderness. Now, if you don't know what they were doing, listen, these people were bummed out. They had no idea what was going on. They were on their way to the promised land. Hey, it's cool. But hey, they listen, for 400 years, they screamed out to God, get us out of here, get us out of here, get us out of here. They were slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt. 400 years later, God sends Moses down there, gets them out, they get into the wilderness. He's taken the promised land, and you can't believe what they did while they were there. So what I want you to do is see what God says about these people that were wandering in the, in the wilderness. They were believing Jews. That would today make them what we call a Messianic Jew. You're either a racial Jew or a Messianic Jew. A racial Jew is a Jew, but they, got their, they have the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they're unbelievers. They failed to understand what the tabernacle, all the sacrifice and all that were. They failed to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Paul had that same problem until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. So these, these believers, these Jews are believers in the wilderness. They've already seen all the miracles and everything that God did to get them out of Egypt and get them to where they are. So I want you to compare the spiritual status of Jewish believers wandering in the wilderness with the spiritual status of Christians in America over the last 60 years. I rather imagine most of you that are in the room today are old enough to at least go back to the 60s and some before that. So I want you to compare Jewish believers in the wilderness and Christians in the United States of America today. Now, with that in mind, I um, want to ask you the following question. Do I, do you understand the source of America's contemporary suffering. Now, I've given you a list of uh, some terms here, Moses and Aaron, Levites, covenant box, priest, altar, tent, fire pan. These phrases come up in this section of scripture. And if you wondered what they were, I'll, I'll comment on them as I go. But these are terms that come up that may throw somebody off, off uh, base. They're not quite sure what that means. But I want to go down below that and say the events. Now, listen. The events that occurred in that in, chap, in Numbers chapter 1 through 12 were simply a prelude. That means they were an introduction to what God is going to tell Moses and through Moses in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 and on. So really, if you read the first 12 chapters of Numbers, you'd say, this is boring. What's all this about? God's telling you, if you're going to if you're going to worship me, here are the things you need to do. He's talking about the sacrifices, what goes on the temple, what goes on the tabernacle, etc. Okay, but when you get to verse 13, chapter thirteen, once he has told these people, this is what this life is going to be like for you people who are Jews. Chapter thirteen then is the chapter wherein the Israelites begin to demonstrate disobedience. So what happens is in the first twelve chapters, here's what you do. By the time you get to chapter 13, this is what you're doing. And it has nothing to do with what God wants them to do. So let's begin in verse, uh, verse 1 in chapter 13, and here's what it says. It says, the Lord said to Moses, choose one of the leaders from each of the 12 tribes and send them as spies to explore the land of Canaan. So they're in the wilderness. God's taken them to promised land. They're not there yet. But there's some, some things going on uh, in this area of Canaan that he wants these people to see. By the way, it's just going to be a test. The question is, when they get in the land of Canaan, get over there and spy out the land, what are they going to do? What are they going to tell Moses when they come back about, oh, wow, this is a great place. We can't wait to get over there. Well, let's ask, 
let's ask Moses what they're going to do and what they're going to say. Now, remember comparing the Israelites with Christians in the United States today. So they're going to explore the land. He said, the land which I am giving to the Israelites. So Moses obeyed, and from the wilderness of Paran, he sent out the leaders as follows. So in, chap in, in chapter 13, verses 14 through 16, actually each verse there lists one of the people that was chosen to go into the promised land, or go into Canaan as a spy. So we see all those people, and what we find out is in that list of people, 12 of them, there are two men, Joshua, his name was Hoshea, and we we'll see in verse 16 that Moses changed his name. But Caleb and Joshua were two of those 12 men. Now, when he says in verse 17, here's what we'll find in the next four verses. Moses then is going to give direction to these 12 men who are going to go into the land and spy it out and come back and tell them what it's all about. So Moses now gives directions to the 12 spies. We need to know, we need to know the purpose of the spies, you and I. We need to know the purpose of the spies. So we have to read the, the previous verses to find out what are they going to do when they get there. So we need to know the purpose of the spies so as to properly assess their obedience. When you, when you see them going out, here's what you do. They come back and they say, wait a minute, when we got there, here's what we saw. You have to know what was going on, what they were supposed to be doing when they got there, so you'll know whether we're being obedient, whether somebody's going to give you fake news about what, what happened while they were up there. So we're going to find out what they were supposed to do when they got there. So in verse 17, here's what Moses told us. They're, they're down here in the south in a place in a wilderness called Paran. They're going up here to a place called Canaan, and they're going to go through the southern part to the northern part and into the mountains to find out what that place is really like. So in verse 16, it says, these are the spies Moses sent to explore the land. That's that 12, including Joshua and Hosea, Joshua and Caleb. So he says in, in, the, in, verse, in verses 17 to 20 then, Moses is going to give direction to these 12 spies. And he says, go north from here into the southern part of the land. Now, that's an instruction. That's what they're supposed to be doing. He said, then on into the hill country. And what you need to realize is from the wilderness of Paran to where they're going is 150 miles from here. They're going to, they're going to travel 150 miles. So they're going on their way then. And what they're going to do is about seven things. They're, they're supposed to go in and find out what the country, uh, what kind of country it is. They're going to find out how many people live there. They're going to find out how strong they are. They're going to find out whether the land is good or bad. They're going to find out whether the people live in open towns or in fortified cities and find out whether the soil is fertile and whether the land is wooded and to be sure to bring back some of the fruit that grows there. Now, what we need to realize is that bring some fruit back. It just so happened at that point in time, it was the season that grapes were beginning to ripen. So there are seven things they're supposed to do while they're up there on this 150 mile trip. In verses 21 through 25, the spies are going to explore the land. And here's what we're told. It said, so the men, went, the men went north and explored the land from the south all the way to the north. Now they get to Canaan, they started out here in the south. And they explored it all the way up to the northern part of Canaan. It says the southern part of the land, listen now, here's what they're going to see. It says the southern part of the land is where the descendants, not the, not the real people, but the descendants of a race of giants lived. So when they get there, they see a bunch of people and say, wait, there, there's over there. This was, this was a, a location where there were some giants that lived there in the past, okay? This is then they came to the Escal Valley and cut off a branch which had one bunch of grapes and that the, the bunch was so great that they had to take two guys, put a pole on each of their shoulders and put this great big bunch of grapes on it to carry it around until they get back. That's how big they were. So then it says they also, they, they brought back some pomegranates and some figs. After exploring, now listen, after exploring the land for how many days? For 40 days, 
the spies returned to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh, also known as Kadesh Barnea, and they were in the wilderness of Paran. They're back down in that wilderness. That's the location from which they came. So they've already been on a 300 mile trip, 150 miles up, 150 miles back, and then they were supposed to do what they were doing that they were told to do. Said when they got back, they reported what they had seen. Now hold on here. We're going to we're, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the spiritual status of this group of men that went up into into Canaan to spy out the land, twelve of them, and we're going to get the report that they're going to give Moses when they get down. So up till now everything's cool. You know, hey guys, get on get on the way, get on up there, see what's up there, come back and give a report. It says they they reported what they had seen and showed them the fruit that he that they brought back. Then they told Moses, we explored the land and found it to be rich and fertile. Wow, that's great. Okay, that's that's good. It says and here is some of, and here is some of the fruit. They showed them those great big grapes. Then the next word. Every time I hear this word, I don't care whose mouth it comes out of. When I hear this word, I say, uh oh, you better listen carefully. And what is that word? It's B U T. But, oh, yes, yeah. so, oh, yes, wonderful. Oh, yes, I saw this over there, I saw that over there. And you can't believe this over there. But, but everything has been fine up to this point. But now you get to this three letter word, but, oh, look, it's been fine. Oh, the ground is fertile. Look. So it's so big and it's just so wonderful. Let me taste one of these Moses. Okay. So they, they come back and said, but here's what they said. Now remember, there's, there's 12 of these guys. But what you need to realize is that only 10 of them are given this report. Joshua and Caleb are over here and they're listening to this stuff, okay? And this guy says, but the people who live there, whoo, wow, they are powerful. And their cities, you can't believe it, Moses. Those cities are so big. And up there, when we were up there, said they had walls. Oh, the walls were way up there, and they were so fortified. Now you get the idea. Now what they're telling, what they're trying to tell Moses is, we ain't going. We're not going up there. You can't believe Moses. You brought us out of the world. You brought us out of Egypt. We cried out for four hundred years. Look what you did. You brought us up here, and you can't believe what we see up there. Yes, it's supposed to be the promised land. So they're bad mouthing what they see up there, okay? Oh, they're powerful. They're so big. They said even worse, even worse than the power, the power and, and the big walls and the big cities and everything. He said, even worse, we saw the descendants of the giants that were there. Wow. Amalekites. These were enemies of Israel. They live in the southern part of the land. Hittites, their name means terror. Jebusites. It's a continual snare. Jebusite means these people were a continual snare for the Israelites. And the Amorites, what were they? They were arrogant and boastful people. Now, all of them live in the hill country up there. And Moses, that's where we're going. It's supposed to be a promised land. It's supposed to be real cool up there. Oh, yeah. But look look what we see. See, this is 10 of these people giving the report. Remember what we're doing? We're evaluating that we're evaluating the spiritual life of these people that were coming out of Egypt that were being led to the promised land. And this bad report comes back from 10 of these 12 people. So after, the, after they did that, it says, uh, these people live by the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan River. Now, after hearing the report that was given to Moses, what happened? The people, the rest of the people out there listening to this. And you know what they do? They start to complain. They start to complain. Can't believe this. You're taking, you're taking us up there? Did you hear what these guys are telling us up there? So the people then, all these people then, millions of people, begin to complain once they hear this report. Now remember, we're, we're evaluating and comparing the, life, the spiritual life of these people back then, believers, and believers in the United States of America today. So after Caleb heard this, Caleb steps up. Caleb silenced the people. All those people out there complaining. Caleb silenced the people who were complaining against Moses and said, here's what Caleb said. After hearing that bad report, he said, Caleb said, we should attack now. 
and take the land. We're strong enough to conquer it. Hold it now. You know all the stuff that's going on in the United States today. I'm a pastor. I'm responsible to teach the word of God. It is amazing to me how many stupid, ignorant American people are, and most of them Christians, because they ain't getting it. They're not understanding. They don't realize what's going on. So here's what happened. But the men who had gone with Caleb said, no, no, we're, we're not strong enough to attack them. See, Caleb says, hey, let's go, let's, get up, let's go on with this thing. Let's go on. But no, the men who had gone with Caleb said, no, we're not strong enough to attack them. The people there are more powerful than we are. So they spread a false report. These people spread a false report. You know what that's called? Fake news. Fake news. You know anything at all about fake news? You know anything about fake news? You know anything about fake news? Maybe my hearing aids need to be turned up. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay, very good. So here's what happened. They spread false, they've spread a false report. And they spread it among the Israelites, all those thousands and thousands of people getting this false report. So they spread it among the, the Israelites about the land that they had explored. And they said, the land, listen, they said the land doesn't even produce enough to feed the people who live there. Fake news. Everyone we saw was very tall. Fake news. And we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. False news. We felt said we felt. Oh my goodness, Moses, you can't believe it. We got up there and we saw what was going on. I looked at myself and I looked at them. Moses, I felt like a grasshopper. They're up here and I'm way down here. And I believe what uh, Moses. I believe I felt like a grasshopper. I think they thought that I looked like a grasshopper. And that is how we must have looked to them. Then he goes on in, well, matter of fact, that's the end of verse, that's the end of chapter 13. So looking at all that in chapter 13, here's some comments that I have to make. And all this has many lessons for you and me. This what's, what's in chapter 13 there. The Israelites, now watch this. The Israelites were to possess the land of Canaan. You understand that was their objective? The objective was to get to Canaan, which was the promised land. God led them out of, out of uh, Egypt after 400 years, got them up there, getting ready to take them in the land. They, God knows there's going to be opposition up there. So God's prepared to take care of all that if they'll just get into the land. Now, I want to ask a question to you. If you understand what's going on today, are you willing to take a stand, a biblical stand, a Christian stand, are you willing to are you willing to share the gospel? Are you willing to tell the truth about what's going on out here? Masks, no masks, vaccines, no vaccines. Yes, yeah, CRT, no CRT. Excuse me. You understand what's happening today? If you don't, you're part of the problem. And this is why I'm asking to compare Christianity in the United States today with what was going on in in, uh, in the wilderness with those believing Jews at that point in time. So here's the idea. Israel was to possess the was to possess, possess the promised land. You and I as born again Christians, and this is something that most Christians don't understand today. I believe those of you who are here today and have been under my ministry and believe what I'm teaching and believe what God's saying, you understand this. Here's the issue. Israel was to possess the land. We're to possess the high ground of super grace. What is super grace? Super grace is mature status. It's mature status. So the Christian way of life, once you become a born-again Christian, it's not just a matter of going to church, singing songs, going to Sunday school class, giving your tithe, which you don't need to tithe anyway. Do all this, all these things that, uh, that you're being told to do without realizing that the spiritual maturity, thinking like Christ thinks, feeling like he feels, speaking like he speaks, and doing like he did, that is the Christian way of life. It cannot be accomplished until we reach the high ground of super grace, which is spiritual maturity. Christians are failing as badly as the Israelites. Now, remember, I'm asking you, do you understand what's going on in the country today? What is your attitude toward all this? How are you handling all this? Are you doing like the, like the Jews did in the wilderness? Complain, complain, bellyache, gripe, moan, angry, bitter, resentful, uh, just duck my head, 
stick my tail through the legs and go back in the bedroom and I'm never going to come out again. Is that what's is that what's happening? Or what is your attitude as you're facing all of this? So Christians today are failing as badly as the Israelites did. The Israelites complained about the journey to the promised land. Christians are complaining about the personal battles on the way to super grace, to spiritual maturity. Now, in chapter 14, verse 1, we see the rebellion. Now remember, they came back and gave this report. Ten of these guys give fake news, false reports. Caleb stands up, and actually Joshua is with him. Joshua's on the same page that Caleb is. Two of them, okay? In verse 1, it says, all night long, the people cried out in distress. I'm asking, what's going on in our country today? With all the circumstances of life that are happening. All night long, the people cried out in distress. I ask a question. Are America's, are America's Christians complaining about anything? They complained about Moses and Aaron, and they said it would have been better to die in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. We'd just rather die. Why in the world is the Lord taking us in that land? We'll be killed in battle. Our wives and children will be captured. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? So you know what they did? So they said to one another, let's choose a leader to take us back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron bowed to the ground in front of all the people. And Joshua, Joshua son of Nun, that's N-U-N, Nun, and Caleb, son of, uh, son of Yafuna, two of the spies, now watch this, two of the spies who were willing to trust God, what do they do? They tore their clothes in sorrow and said to the people, the land we explored is an excellent land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll take us, up, he'll take us there and give us that rich and fertile land. What did they tell him? He said, no, there's not enough. You can't raise enough food up there to live. He said, we will conquer them easily. Now, what I want you to understand is the very same thing. While they were trying to conquer the land and they had all those problems they were facing up there with people who are enemies of the Israelites, you are looking today as a born again Christian with many, many things that are opposing you because you're a believer, opposing you because you are a Christian. So the question is, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to do like, like the, uh, the 10, complain, gripe, bellyache, or how are you going to do that? So uh, as he goes on in, uh, in verse 4, so they, said, so they said to one another, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron, again, they're the leaders. Moses is the prophet selected by God. Aaron is the high priest over all of the priests regarding the temple and the tabernacle. Okay? So they're going to choose another leader. Then Moses and Aaron bowed to the ground in front of the people, and Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of, uh, son of Jephunneh, two of the spies who were willing to trust God, they tore their, their clothes in sorrow and said to the people, the land we explored is an excellent land. If the Lord is pleased, he will take us there and give us that rich and fertile land. He says, do not rebel against the Lord. Now, let me point out something. As you're looking at all the circumstances of life today, how are you handling them? And what you're going to discover is that in the, in the analogy between the, between the Israelites and the wilderness and born-again Christians in the United States today, there is, there is that analogy, and here's the issue. As the Jews were rebelling against, uh, against God because they were not willing to follow his, his plan, so today, if you are complaining about a president, if you're complaining about a, 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 uh, an elected official, if you're complaining about the gas, if you're plain, complaining about the oil, if you're complaining about Sparky, if you're complaining about something else, guess what? God is in control of all this. And what it amounts to is when you complain about that, you are complaining and rebelling against God. Is that clear, Cody? See, as, as you complain about those things, really you're complaining about God because he is in control of all of this. Now, as we move on from there, uh, let's see, uh, in um, uh, down about verse 8. He said, if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll take us there and give us the rich and fertile land. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people who live there. 
don't be afraid of the people around here messing with us, okay? We will conquer them easily. The Lord is with us and has defeated the gods who protected them. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now the Lord shows up again. So what happens is when all these all this rigmarole is going on and uh, you're getting a good report from two guys and getting a bad report from 10, all of a sudden the Lord shows up. And in verse 10, but suddenly the people saw the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appear over the tent. Now notice this. We got all these thousands and thousands of, of uh, believing Jews who are for failing to be obedient to God. And all of a sudden they look up with all this complaint and everything else. Whoop, there's that light up there. Oh my goodness. Here it comes again. The Lord shows up, okay? But suddenly the people saw the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appear over the tent. In verse 11, the Lord and Moses have a conversation one with another. God and Moses are now going to talk back and forth about this. So the Lord said to Moses, how much longer will these people reject me? Wait a minute. Have you ever thought about that? What's going on in the United States today with all the Christians? And by the way, it, it, I, I'm not quite sure how you're, how you're taking this, but that's your problem, not mine. I want you to understand that what I'm talking about is I have every right as a born again Christian. I have every right as a as a pastor to evaluate the lives of other people. I can't judge you in the sense of punishing you in any way, but I have every right and you have every right to evaluate the life of everyone around you. You can evaluate the life of your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your boss, your best friend your boyfriend, your girl, you as a Christian have the right to evaluate the lives of other people. How in the world, if you don't do that, how in the world can you evaluate contemporary history? How can you stand on the right side of history if you don't know what the score is? So in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, how much longer will these people reject me? How much longer will they refuse to, to trust in me, even though I have performed so many miracles among them? Here's what he says in verse 12. Are you ready? He said, I will send an epidemic to destroy them. But I will make you, Moses, the father of a nation that is larger and more powerful than they. Epidemic, God is in control. Okay? He's allowing these things to happen. So at that time, deliverance of the faithful Israelites, there, in other words, there, there, there's going to be, although God's going to deal with these thousands and thousands of people that are failing him there are two of these people and others that are going to be okay so today how do we how do we evaluate this he says moses you're going to be the father of a nation that is larger uh, larger and more powerful than they now at any time deliverance of the faithful israel uh, israelites in other words god says there's going to come a time when all this when all this is over I'm going to deliver you out of this mess, those of you who are faithful. I'm going to do that. Well, how do we evaluate to today? Here's the, here's, uh, here are these Israelites now facing this promised land up there with all these enemies and everything else that's going on and all these people murmuring. You take a look at today and see what's going on in our country today and ask yourself, how are Christians handling this? And God says, I'm going to deliver you. God is going to deliver the faithful. He's going to deliver the faithful Israelite who's believing, trusting, and willing to go into the promised land and let God handle the circumstances as they go. When you and I as born-again Christians face with all this mess out here today, guess what? God will deliver you also. He's going to deliver you. He will deliver you. He will deliver you in the midst of all this. But you have to get the super grace. He's not going to deliver you people who are out there just fiddling around, talking about you now. All you people out there who are messing around, going to church, singing songs, going to study school class, doing this, going out and helping. Understand the difference between human good and divine good. And there's a meeting at the Bema Seat of Christ for every born again Christian. He said, I will send an epidemic. Wuhan virus. He said, I'll send an epidemic and destroy them. But I will make you, Moses, the father of a nation that is larger and more powerful than they are. But Moses said to the Lord, You're, you, bought, you brought these people out of Egypt by your power, miracle after miracle after miracle. He said, when the Egyptians, Moses says, when the Egyptians hear what you have done to your people, 
hey, God's going to take care of these people out here. And down there in Egypt, he said, man, you bugged us for how many years, Moses, to get these people out of there? And we finally let you go. Wait a minute. Those Egyptians down there, they say, hey, wait a minute. You got to see what happened up there in the wilderness. God sent Moses down there to get them out. Guess what? They, he got them up in the wilderness and zapped them all. Then up there and killed them all. Destroyed them all. Wait a minute. So he says, when the Egyptians hear what you have done to your people, they will tell it to the people who live in this land. In other words, words going to get down from down there all the way up to Canaan, and all these Amorites and Hittites and Jebusites are going to hear about what God did to His own people. These people, those that lived, uh, those that were living in this and the spied out land, have already heard that you, Lord, are with us. And that you appear in plain sight when your cloud stops over us, and that you go before us as, uh, in, a, in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You're with us, Father. They see that. Now, Lord, if you kill all your people, the nations who have heard your fame will say that you killed your people in the wilderness. How about this? You killed your people in the wilderness because you were not able to bring them into the promised land. Yeah, see, uh, that. that Moses come down and tell us about God. Oh, this great God out there. See, folks, I was trying to tell you that God failed. He was not able to get these people into the promised land. You know that's fake news, don't you? So now he says, Lord, I pray. I, Moses, I pray, show your power and do what you promised when you said. Moses now quotes God. Here's what God said. I, the Lord, am not easily angered. And I show great love and faithfulness and forgive sin and rebellion. Yet he said, I will not fail to punish children. Listen, hold it now. I, we've, been trying, we've been trying to tell our folks, pastors who are understanding what's going on today, are telling people and telling Christians that if you're not willing to stand in this period of time, guess what? As we see everything falling apart all around us, guess what? You have your children, there's your grandchildren, and there are your great-grandchildren. And he says, let me show you what I'm going to do to your children, your great your grandchildren, and your great grandchildren. Here's what he says in verse 16. He says uh, th that you killed your people in the wilderness because you were not able to bring them into the promised land. He said, "So now, Lord, I pray, show us your power that that uh, and do what you promised you would say. You said you would do." And he says, "I, the Lord, am not easily angered. I show great love and faithfulness and forgive sin and rebellion." Yet I will not fail to punish children, grandchildren, and third great-grandchildren to the fourth generation. Are you listening? That means we who fail today, we who fail today are failing our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And I have great-grandchildren. And maybe you do too. But if we don't stand, guess what? They will reap the benefit. Oh, the benefit of what we didn't do. And God said, I will not. He said, I will not fail to punish children, grandchildren, and great and your great-grandchildren of the fourth generation. Why? Not because they did anything wrong. Are you ready? Not because they did anything wrong. He said, but because of the sins of the parents. So we sin. We, we reject God. We don't do what he wants. We don't claim the high, land, uh, the, the high ground of super grace. We don't do and fulfill God's plan for our life. And who's the benefactor of that? Negatively, my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. For the sins of the parents. He says, and now, Lord, according to the greatness of your unchanging love, forgive, I pray, the sin of the people, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. So what happened? The Lord answered and said, oh, yeah, okay, Moses, I'm going to forgive them. I will forgive them as you ask. Now watch here. There's another B-U-T. Oh, yeah. He said, I'm going to forgive them. He said, but I promise that as surely as I live and as surely as my presence fills the earth, none, none, N-O-N-E, none of these people, 20 years of age and older, will live to enter that land. They have, they have seen the dazzling light of my presence and the miracles that I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but they have tried my patience over and over and over again and have refused to obey me. 
verse 23. He said they will never enter it. They're 20 years old, old, 20 years of age and older. With the exception of Moses, of uh, the exception of Joshua and Caleb, said they will never enter the land which I promised to their ancestors. None of them who have rejected me will ever enter it. Because my servant Caleb had a different attitude. He was he was positive and has remained loyal to me. Two men. Can you imagine that? Two out of thousands and thousands and thousands. Caleb has a different mental attitude and has remained loyal to me. And I will bring him into the land which he explored. And I'm also going to bring his descendants in with him. They also will possess the land in, whom, in whose valleys the Amalekites, the Canaanites now live. And here's what he tells Moses. Moses, turn back and go into the wilderness in the direction of the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, in verses 26 through 39, are you ready? God's going to give us the divine sentence for disobedience. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how much longer are these wicked people going to complain against me? He said, I've heard enough of their complaints. Now, give them this answer. Moses, here's what I want you to tell them. I swear that as surely as I live, I will do to you just what you have asked. I, the Lord, have spoken. You will die and your corpses will be scattered across the wilderness. Because you have complained against me, none of you. Now remember, complaining against the God isn't always just directly complaining this way to God. It would be complaining, uh, you, you complaining to somebody in charge, some leader out here that's doing what God wants. You complain about that person and God says, wait a minute, just a second. You complain against him, you're complaining against me. You rebel against him, you're rebelling against me. See, verse uh, verse 21, he said, but I promise that as surely as I live and as surely as my presence fills the earth, none of these people, 20 years of age or older, will live to enter the land. They've seen the dazzling light of my presence and the miracles that I performed in Egypt in the wilderness, but they have tried my patience over and over again and have refused to obey me. Verse 23, they will never enter the land which I promised their ancestors. None of these who have rejected me will enter it, but because my servant Caleb and has a different attitude and has remained loyal to me, I will bring him into the land which he, he explored and his descendants will possess the land. Then go back down to verse 26 through 39, the divine sentence. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how much longer are these wicked people going to complain against me? I've heard enough of their complaints. Now give them this answer. I swear that as surely as I live, I will do to you just what you have asked. I, um, I, the Lord, have spoken. He said, you will die and your corpses will be scattered across the wilderness. But because you have complained against me, none of you over 20 years of age will enter the land. I promised to let you live there, but not one of you will except jo uh, Caleb and Joshua. See, they were the faithful ones. He said, you said that your children would be captured, but I will bring them into the land that you rejected, and it will be their home. That's the land, the descendants of Jacob and, and, uh, and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua. Your children, now watch this. He said, your children, that they're still in the wilderness now. He said, I'm going to deliver Caleb, Joshua, and their descendants. But he said, you will, you will wander. Let's see here. Verse 33, your children will wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So God's not going to not gonna let them go in. He's going to let these people, these children who are going in, he's going to let them wander in the wilderness for 40 years till these older people die. And what do we call that? He says, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last one of you dies. These children, grandchildren, etc., are going to have to wander there for 40 years till these people die before he brings them in. You will know what it means to have me against you. He said, I swear that he, I swear that I will do this to you wicked people who have gathered together against me. Here in the wilderness, every one of you will die. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 36 and 37. The men, 10 of the 12, that Moses had sent to explore the land brought back a false report, fake news, which caused the people to complain against the Lord. And so the Lord struck 
struck them, 10 of 12 spies, he struck them with a disease and they died. Of the 12 spies, only Joshua and Caleb survived. Do you have any idea why they didn't die? That's a, that's a rhetorical question. I'm asking, do you have any idea why they didn't die? When Moses told the Israelites what the Lord had said, they mourned bitterly. Now, here's a contemporary application of that. If you are consistently living in the green circle, now, if you don't know what the green circle is, that's the, that's the sphere of the spirit. You're living in the sphere of the spirit. That's an experientially spiritual life. You're doing the right thing and you're doing it the right way. So if you're consistently living, doing the right thing in the right way, you are suffering by association. So those of you that are here today and living the right kind of a life, guess what? All this pressure out here, you are suffering by association. And the question is, does God have the capacity to allow you to handle all that? And the answer is yes. If you don't know that, you're complaining and you're rebelling just like the Jews did in the wilderness. So here's a contemporary application. If you consistently live in the green circle, you're suffering by association because of the spiritual failure of millions of Christians in the United States of America today who are living in disobedience to God in the angelic complex. Now, if you haven't heard me enough to understand all that, I'm sorry. Here's a warning. If you are complaining about any current situation or circumstance of life, Annette, do you hear me? By the way, she's not complaining. I'm just asking. She's sitting in the hot seat, okay? Cody, you hear me? How about back there? Brian, you hear me? Here's a warning to all of you, to me too. If you're complaining about any current situation or circumstance, listen, don't try to minimize this. Don't tell me you're complaining is something else. Don't try to call it something else. Call it something other than what it is. Complaining is complaining. Maribor, belly aching, griping. If you are complaining about any current circumstance or situation in life, understand this. God the Father has not caused the situation or the circumstance, but he has permitted them to, permitted them to occur, and your complaints, your arguments, your fears, your worries, your resentment, your anger, your bitterness, your hatred are rejections of God. Check that. No different from the rejection of God by the Israelites in the wilderness. The issue for us today is not contemporary world problems. Listen to this. Our problem today is not contemporary problem, world problems. The issue for us today is not contemporary world problems, but how you, how I, how we handle the problems associated with contemporary history. Now, we see the presumption of the people and defeat. So all these people now are starting to get the picture. Oh, my goodness, look what, look what God says he's going to do to us. Oh, we've messed up. We've messed up. What I want you to tell, what I want you to tell, what I want to tell you is this: If um, yesterday the uh, Arkansas Razorback football team won in the last few seconds of the game, okay? Now let's suppose that um, they were uh, lined up two yards from the goal line, and the clock is ticking down, and the quarterback is under there going. Oh, 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 and and the, here's something. Like, ding, game's over. Now they hike the ball. They center the ball. The uh, fullback gets the ball, runs across the, the, uh, the goal line, and the team goes. Wee, wee, wee. The game is over. The game's over. So what happened here? We see the same thing. The presumption of the people. God has said, look, here's what's happened to you. Here's, where, here's how you failed. I've tried to show you, show you, show you. You never did get the picture. He said, wait a minute. Oh, okay, we get the picture now, God. We're going. Early in the morning, they, the disobedient believers, started out to invade the hill country in Canaan, saying, now we're ready to go to the place which the Lord told us about. We admit we've sinned. Oh, yes, we've sinned. But Moses said, then why are you disobeying the Lord now? You will not succeed. Please don't go. The Lord is not with you, and your enemies will defeat you. When you face the Amalekites and the Canaanites, you will die in battle. The Lord will not be with you because you have refused to follow him. Yet they still dare to go up into them. See, they're trying to gain the victory after the, after the bells rung. Even though neither of neither the Lord's covenant box, that's the Ark of the Covenant, and see, the Ark of the Covenant was not going to go. They weren't going to take it with them. And Abraham, Moses wasn't going with them. 
Moses is the prophet leader, and the Ark of the Covenant is a is a container where when wherever that thing goes, the presence of God is there. So they're going out into they're going out to fight these people in the flesh as carnal believers. They have no power. God says, "Let them go." Then the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived there attacked them and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hormah. Now, the, I've, got a, I've got a description here of what the, the covenant box was. Now, in verses 1 through 16 of chapter 15, concerning offerings in the land. Now, here's the issue. Let me see what time it is. Hang on just a second. 1049. Okay, I think I've got time to do this. If I didn't have time, I wasn't going to read this, but I want to share this with you also. Concerning the offerings in the land. So, Paul, his, Moses is going to say, look, God's going to tell you what to do when you get in the land. Now, remember... 20 years of age over, you're dying, you're dead, you're not going in. Those Joshua, uh, Caleb, your descendants, you're going in, and here's what God wants you to do. In verses 1 through 16, concerning the offerings in the land, uh, in verse 1, it says, chapter 15, verse 1, the Lord gave Moses the following regulations. Now, let me ask you a question. If God gives anybody a regulation, is it okay to ignore it? No, not at all. So these people, when they get in the land, here's what they're going to have to do. He said, the Lord gave Moses the following regulations for the people of Israel to observe in the land that he was going to give them. God's going to give it to them. Now, in verses 17 through 31, we get, so in verses 1 through 16, we get the, we get the, uh, the regulations. I'm not going to do that. It's, that's where they are. In verses 17 through 31, the second communication concerning uh, uh, offerings. So you get... One set in verse 1 through 16, 17 on through 31, you get a second communication concerning offerings. And here's what he said. I want you to see this. He said, the Lord gave Moses the following regulations for the people of Israel to observe in the land that he was going to give them. Now, let me point, it, point this out. These are not for you and me. This is the law. This is for Israel. And even for Israel today, it's not valid. Because since 70 AD, we have... The body of Christ, we're living according to the mystery doctrines of the age of grace, period. So he says in verse 17, the Lord gave Moses the following regulations for the people of Israel to, to observe in the land that he was going to give them. Verse 22, it says, but, some, but, but suppose someone or, or the community unintentionally fails. So here's the issue. It's possible to fail in more than one way. So God says, here are the regulations, but it... What happens if you unintentionally fail to keep some of these regulations, which the Lord has given to Moses? He said, if that happens, if the mistake was made because of ignorance of the community, they are to offer a certain sacrifice for purification. So in other words, God, had, God gave them an out if it was unintentional. He said in verse 30, but anyone who sins, whose sin is deliberate, whether they are natives or foreigners passing through the land, they are guilty of treating the Lord with contempt. So in other words, all you have to do is to fail to, to do the offering, whatever this thing is out here. And while you say, whoo, I failed there. No, he says, God says, look up here. He said, you failed me when you failed down there. Because they had rejected what the Lord had said and have deliberately broken one, not all, but broken one of his commands. They're responsible. They are responsible for their own death. In other words, it was a volitional choice they made to do the wrong thing. Then in verses verse 32 through 36, I think this is interesting. How about, oh, just breaking the Sabbath? When I was a kid growing up, living in Georgia's Run, Ohio, three doors down from us was a family who had two boys. And they had a, a very nice car back in that, that point in time. It had probably been back in, uh, in the, the mid-50s. And every Sunday... These boys were out there shining that, that car. And everybody would tell them, uh, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be doing that. This is the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath. Well, Sabbath is not Sunday, okay? Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. The people were complaining because this was a Christian family, but the boys were out there watching their car on the Sabbath. And it says in verse 22, uh, no, verse, uh, verse 30, he said, but who, but any Anyone uh, who sins deliberately, whether they're natives or foreigners, are guilty of treating the Lord with contempt. And what do you do? If you sin deliberately, you will be put to death. Isn't it amazing? 
for one thing. Just don't do it. And you're going to die. Why? Because they rejected what the Lord had said and deliberately broke one, not all, but one of his commands. They're responsible for their own death. Now, the Sabbath breaker in verse 32. Once while the, while the Israelites were still in the wilderness, a man was found gathering firewood on the Sabbath. He's out there gathering firewood on the Sabbath. He was taken to Moses' Aaron and the whole community and was put under guard because it was not clear what should be done with him. Then the Lord said to Moses, he was gathering wood on the Sabbath. And the Lord said to Moses, the man must be put to death. The whole community is to stone him to death outside the camp. So the whole community took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord had commanded. Let me ask you a question. Do you realize that if you were living at that point in time, that you would be required to gather stones and cast stones at this person until they're dead? You would be responsible for that. Then in, in verse, uh, let's see, in verse, uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. Now what we get, you see, the, you see the, the, the mindset of all these people. Now we have a leader whose name is Korah, who's going to rebel further. It says Korah the Levite, of the, from the Levite clan, and the Levites were the people who tended the temple, the, the, the tabernacle, etc., Korah, the Levite from the clan of Kohath, he rebelled against the leadership of Moses. Now you're, at, now you're after the leader. He was joined by three members of the tribe of Reuben and by 250 other Israelites, well-known leaders chosen by the community. So the community said, oh, let's see, we need some leaders out here. So we've got, we've got Korah, we've got three men from the top tribe of, of, uh, of Reuben, and we got 250 other men who've been selected as, um, as leaders. Now it says they assembled all these people then, 250 plus three plus four. These assembled before Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone to Moses? Tell you what, buddy, you've gone too far. All the members of the community belong to the Lord. See, you don't understand something, Moses. Hold it now. You don't understand. All these people here, we belong to the Lord. We don't care whether you're our leader or not. We belong to the Lord. Well, that's not going to be quite so. It says that the Lord is with, and the Lord is with us. Now watch this. He says the Lord is with all of us. Truth of the matter is, no, God isn't with them. They're rebelling against. They're rebelling against Him. Why then, Moses, do you set yourself above the Lord's community? When Moses heard this, he threw himself on the ground and prayed. Then he said to Korah and his followers, watch this. He said to Korah and his followers, tomorrow morning, guys, he said, the Lord will show us who belongs to him. Is it me or is it you? He will let, he will let the one who belongs to him, that is the one he has chosen, is it me or is it you? He's going to let, let the, the one who belongs to him approach him, God, at the altar. So tomorrow morning, you and your followers take fire pans. These are simply metal pans that you put uh, coals in it, start a fire, then put incense on it. It says, tomorrow morning, you and your followers take fire pans, put live coals and incense on them, and take them to the altar. Then we will see which of us the Lord has chosen. You Levites are the ones who have gone too far. Moses continued to speak to Korah. Listen, you Levites, do you consider it a small matter that the God of Israel has set you apart from the rest of the community so that you can approach him, God, and perform your service in the Lord's tabernacle and minister to the community and serve them, you take that lightly. God has chosen you for this. He has let you and all the other Levites have this honor, and now you're trying to take the priesthood away from Aaron. When you complain against Aaron, it, your complaint, is really a complaint against the Lord. You see that? They're complaining against Aaron. You're standing right there, Aaron. I've had it with you. And what God's saying, listen, if you tell if you tell Aaron you've had it with him, really what you're saying, you've had it with me. When you complain against Aaron, uh, uh, you complain against the Lord and, and that you and your followers are rebelling. Then Moses and Dathan, Moses sent for Dathan and Abiram, two leaders, and they, Dathan and Abiram, said, I don't care what you sent for me, I'm not coming, Moses. 
I heard that. Hey, come on over here, David and I. We're not coming, Moses. We're not going to come. He said, isn't it enough that you, Moses, have brought us out of the fertile land of Egypt to kill us here in the wilderness? See, David and Abiram say, look, you brought us out of here just to kill us in the wilderness. Do you, have, do you also have the Lord over us? You certainly have not brought us into the fertile land or given us fields and vineyards of our, as for our possession. And now you're trying to deceive us, Moses. We're not going to come. We don't care whether you want us to come or not. We're not coming. Well, what happened? Moses became angry. That's righteous indignation it was justified and said to the Lord, Moses, speaking to the Lord in anger, do not accept any offerings from these men. I have not wronged any of them. I've not even taken one of their donkeys. Moses said to Korah, no, then, then Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and your followers must come to the tent, the tabernacle, in the presence of the Lord. Aaron, the high priest, will be there. Each of you will take a fire pan, put incense in it, and then present it at the altar. So they each took their fire pans, put live coals and incense on them, and stood at, watch this, and stood at the entrance of the tent, the tabernacle with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah gathered the whole community of Israelites, and they stood facing Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tent. Now the Lord appears again. Suddenly, the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appeared to the whole community. Now what we're going to see is divine punishment is on its way. Here's the discipline in the next few verses. Verse, verse 20 said, the Lord said to Moses, the prophet, and Aaron, the high priest, he said, hey, Moses and Aaron, move back. Move back from these people. And he said, I will destroy them immediately. But Moses and Aaron bowed down with their faces to the ground and said, oh, God, you're the source of our life. When, all, when one of us sins, you, do you become angry with the whole community? Listen to that. He said, look, Lord, he said, when one of us sins, do you become angry with the whole community? The Lord said to Moses, tell the people to move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Byron. Then Moses, accompanied by the leaders of Israel, went to Dathan and Byron. He said to the people, get away from the tents, get away from here, get away from the tents of these wicked men, and don't touch anything that belongs to them. Otherwise, you will be wiped out with them for all their sins. So the people moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram had come out and were standing at the entrance of their tents with their wives, watch this, with their wives and children. Moses said to the people, this is how you'll know that the Lord has sent me. This is Moses speaking to the people now. This is how you'll know that the Lord sent me, not these guys, to do all these things and that it is not done by my own choice that I have done these Look, I, I'm not doing all these things because I want to. I've been called to the Lord to do this. But if the Lord does, does something unheard of, if the Lord does something unheard of, and the earth opens up and swallows them with all they, all they own, so they go down the line to the world of the dead, you will know that these men have rejected the Lord. And as soon as he, Moses, had finished speaking, the ground under Dathan and Abiram split open and swallowed them and their families together. Listen, the men and their families, that's their wives and their children, and all the people of Israel, what did they do? All the people of Israel who were there, they fled when they heard these people cry. They shouted, run, 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 get out of here. The earth might swallow us too. Then the Lord sent a fire that blazed down and burned up the 250 men who had presented the incense at the altar. And for, now you think, oh, well, boy, boy. Hey, God, these people get it now. Woo. Ah, they, they, they went. Yeah, they, they are, they're understanding now. In verse 41, after all that happened, the next day the whole community complained against Moses and Aaron. You've killed some of the Lord's people. After they had gathered to protest to Moses and Aaron, they turned toward the tent, toward the tabernacle, and God showed up again. And saw that the, they saw the cloud that was covering it, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence had appeared. Moses and Aaron went and stood in front of the tabernacle. And what we see in verse 24, 44 now, is the staying of the plague. And the Lord said to Moses, hey, Moses, move back. Move back, Moses. Get away from these people, and I will destroy them on the spot. The two of them bowed down. That's Moses, uh, Moses and Aaron. They bowed down. And uh, Moses said, uh, Aaron, by the way, he said, he said, he's going to kill them all. 
quick, take your fire pan, put live coals from the altar, from the altar on it, and put some incense on the coals. Hey, hurry, hurry, Aaron. Then uh, move over there. To, uh, uh, take that over to the the tabernacle, over to the uh, ark. He said, I want to to perform a ritual of purification for them. Hurry, 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 uh, Aaron. The Lord's anger has already broken out and an epidemic, this is the second one, an epidemic has already begun. So Aaron obeyed, took his fire pan and ran into the middle of the assembled people. And when he saw that the plague had already begun, he put the incense on the coals and performed the ritual of purification for the people. This stopped the plague. And he, Aaron, the high priest, was left standing between the living and the dead. The number of people who had died was 14,700, not counting those who had died in the Korah's rebellion. When the plague had stopped, Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent. Now in verses 1 through 5, chapter 17, God instructs Moses again. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to give you 12 walking sticks. You know, that's a stick, you know, you see people walk along with a stick in their hand. Give you 12 walking sticks, one from each, uh, from the leader of each of the tribes. Write each man's name on the stick, then write Aaron's name on the stick representing Levi. There will be, there will be one walking stick from each tribal leader. Take them to the tent, that's the tabernacle, of my presence, and put them, the walking sticks, put them in front of the Ark of the Covenant, where I, God, meet you. Then the walking sticks of the men, uh, then the walking, the walking stick of the man I have chosen. He says, the walking stick of the man I have chosen, what's it gonna do? He said, that stick's gonna sprout. In this way, I will put a stop to the constant complaining of these, here, uh, these Israelites against you. So the issue is if that thing sprouts, if something unusual happens there, you're going to know that the Lord selected me and not this guy over here. In verse seven, 6 and 7, Moses does exactly what God ordered. He said, so Moses spoke to the Israelites, and each of their leaders gave him a walking stick, one from each tribe, 12 in all, and Aaron's walking stick was put with them as the high priest. See, they're trying to take the priesthood away from him. Moses then put all of the 12 walking sticks in the tent in front of the Lord's covenant box, the Ark of the Covenant. But look what happened in verse 8 through 13. Aaron's walking stick sprouts. The high priest, his walking stick sprouted. The next day when Moses went into the tabernacle, he saw that Aaron's walking stick, represented the tribe of Levi, had sprouted. It had budded, blossomed, and produced ripe almonds. Moses took all the walking sticks and showed them to the Israelites. The Israelites saw what happened, and each leader took his own stick back. Verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, put Aaron's walking stick back in, in front of the covenant box, the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's walking stick is to be, now watch this, Aaron's walking stick is to be kept in front of that, the Ark of the Covenant as what? As a warning to the rebel Israelites that they will die unless their complaining stops. Every time they see that thing and they realize, oh, wait, I've been complaining. God says, I'm going to die if I keep this complaining up. Moses did as the Lord commanded. The people of Israel said to Moses, oh, and that, Moses, that's the end of us. That's the end of us. If anyone even comes near the tabernacle, we're going to die. Then we all are as good as dead. Now let me close with this. Ask yourself a few questions. What was the Israelites' problem? Secondly, what was God's response to their problem? Third question, what is America's problem? Is it the president, Nancy, Chuck, AOC, the progressive left, the rhinos, five Supreme Court justices, CRT, Fauci, hmm, Wuhan lab in China, threat of nuclear attack, just to name a few? Here it is. If you say yes, you still don't understand. If you say no, then what is America's problem? What is America's problem? Joe, come pray for us. Come on up here.
Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We still have the freedom to gather as we have this morning around the table of your word. And yes, there's so much in your word that uh, you gave us, give us understanding of what you expect. You demonstrated life of Israel over and over and over and over and over again. You simply expected obedience to your directives. May we as your children today realize that you have given us the Holy Spirit, you've given us your word, and that the same expectation, your expectation, falls on each one of us. May we choose by our own volition to grow, become mature if we haven't yet. And for those who have reached that maturity level, may they be instruments of yours in this world, in our country at this time, that they can share with any they come in contact with that the only answer is a life in Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh, I believe that. Yes, I will. <clears throat> Again, Father, thank you for your provision. You continue to provide in our lives. May we realize that. And you've provided this food today, sanctified to the nourishment of our body. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, I want, uh, before we start the fellowship and open the door for an embrace or meal, I want to remind you again that Calvin Rogan is here today and uh, Dennis Ball is here. They're running for, they're running for office. Uh, when, when is the, like, when is the election? November. Same, to, same for you, Calvin. Okay. Now, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to introduce yourself to these guys. This is not a political meeting, but these, these guys are one of us. And when you come to understand the importance of the position of a sheriff, county sheriff, I think you'll be amazed. Okay. So God bless you. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and be dismissed for our lunch right here. We just, uh, Cody, just go ahead and open that door. Okay. And I'm going to close out our, our program here and we'll be back this coming. Coming back this coming Wednesday uh, for our next Bible study. God bless you all.